special edition of the Jim Laird Show. And I'm here with my my good friend, Dr. Leland Stillman, uh, MD. And uh, I am actually at the gym. I've come in from the farm because, funny enough, I don't get that good a reception out at the gym. And if we're going to do a podcast, I wanted to make sure that it was at least done well. And unfortunately, it's super windy outside, so I can't do it directly outside. But I got my, my gym doors open here and behind me, in front of me. I've got the doors open and and uh, and all that good stuff. So I will I will start with this. This is a, a strong disclaimer. This is not we are not offering uh, medical advice. This is uh, this show is for information purposes only. So you can go do your own research. You can work with your own doctor uh, and kind of figure out what works best for you. This is just entertainment information purposes only. Um, we are not giving medical advice. Um, yeah. Dr. Stillman, how are you doing today? I'm great, man. Waiting for the, uh, the epidemic to hit, um, where I am in Northern Minnesota. Uh, we have, um, you know, with all this going on and, you know, I won't go too much into directly coronavirus cause we want to talk about the general immune system and immune response, but I have really been looking a lot at, um, I really, what determines, you know, immunity uh, recently over the last really several months and certainly over the last couple of weeks. So happy to be here and thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You know, um, Dr. Stillman, first of all, let, let's talk about a little bit about your medical background. Let's talk about um, why and how you got into medicine and kind of the experience that you've had so far with it. So I grew up uh, my early life in Manhattan and wasn't very healthy. And in retrospect, I realized that's because, you know, I was living the modern lifestyle of the average, you know, urban dwelling American. I lived indoors all day. I ate processed food. We didn't know anything about nutrition or health or all the things that have come out of really the natural health movement over the last 50 or 60 years. And um, I had ear infections as a kid, recurrent sinusitis, took years of antibiotics and then ended up being kind of a sickly young kid. You know, I didn't grow as fast as my friends. I was never as strong, never as fast, never had the same endurance, but I always had this incredible drive and I wanted to be the best in everything that I did. It didn't matter if I was, you know, deciding that I wanted to learn to lift weights or go to medical school or, you know, take a biochemistry test. I wanted to be the best. And it was really frustrating to be held back by, what were really underlying, I guess I'll say, medical issues. And just basically, I didn't have what I needed in order to fulfill uh, my total potential. And this turned into, you know, I, I first began interest, I became interested in, in a career in healthcare when I was about 15. And I was, I had spent the, you know, my entire childhood going with my mother from like one doctor to another. I mean, we tried everything, homeopathy, traditional Chinese medicine, um, we even did like coining and cupping, which is, you know, really out there as far as alternative medical stuff goes in the United States and, uh, got some good results and became convinced of it as a young person. And then at 15, I met a naturopath who really kind of opened my eyes to just what was possible and really pushed me to question everything. But he told me to go to a conventional medical school, get a conventional medical background because it was the it really opened a ton of doors and it was still the most rigorous training that you could get. Uh, so I went to undergrad, I did my undergrad at Connecticut College. I majored in environmental health and biology with a minor in chemistry. And then I went to the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Um, and then I went to uh, do an internal medicine residency at Maine Medical Center. And since then, uh, I have been practicing as a general internist, really kind of trying to figure out what really works and what doesn't work in the very wide, uh, sometimes wonderful, sometimes wacky uh, world of alternative and unconventional medicine. Excellent. And I just do that to, uh, as a disclaimer, because, you know, a lot of people will write somebody like you off if you're like a naturopath or, you, sure. you know, yeah. because you're an MD and you start talking about some of the stuff we're going to be talking about, people might think, well, this guy's an MD who's gone through traditional medical training and he has a different thought process and a different approach. 
So we've got this coronavirus up, uh, outbreak. We've got most people, most of the countries on lockdown, either voluntary or mandatory. Like my business is shut down. And, uh, you know, all we hear about is wash your hands, wash your hands, you know, stay six feet apart. Wear a uh, mask. Yeah. You know, wear a mask. And, and you know, it, the interesting thing is, you know, the people that are most vulnerable for this are people that struggle with immune function. Um, why isn't anybody talking about how the immune system works and what we can do to make our immune system better? Like, why, why, why don't you hear about things like that? And, 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 you know, all we hear about is wash your hands. Yeah, the simple answer to why no one talks about that is that um, healthy people don't make anybody any money because they are independent and they don't need to buy anybody's product or their services. Uh, I joke with my patients that if they want to save money on their health care bills, they should they should sell all their worldly possessions, move to a tropical island and eat a local seasonal diet that's rich in fish, shellfish and seaweed. Because most of the things that I do with my patients focuses on getting them the nutrients that they're missing from those things and getting them back out into nature in order to get the things from nature that they need in order to be healthy. And this is really where in the immune system and our metabolism and you know our whole being really sort of the rubber meets the road. And this is why I, I use the term skin in the game a lot. And when you think about it, the immune system is here to help you be immune. And a lot of people look at the immune system and all they look at is allergies or autoimmune diseases or cancers or you know, your risk of infection. But what's really interesting is that people with allergies have an increased risk of autoimmune diseases, have an increased risk of certain cancers, have an increased risk of metabolic diseases. So the immune system is really an integrated system that cannot be sort of differentiated from any of the different organ systems, right? At the end of the day, if you look at the immune system as the system that keeps you alive, you know, you're just as as dead if you fall down a flight of stairs or catch coronavirus and go into respiratory failure. And what's really interesting is that different, like for example, vitamin D is a good example of this. Vitamin D isn't just involved in your immune response to viruses and bacteria and parasites and whatever, as many people will tell you, it's also involved in your cognition, your neurotransmission, your brain health, your coordination, and your muscle strength. One of the most interesting things about vitamin D to me, especially working with high performing athletes and individuals is that once you get your vitamin D over a certain level, you actually see gains in athletic performance and strength, right? So really this system is about keeping your body robust and healthy. And this is also why, you know, people who eat garbage and end up with diabetes or obesity you know, and I also want to throw in you, they, they watch TV, they don't exercise, whatever. They have a metabolic disease and they're worried about their waistline or their blood sugar, but they're also at increased risk of infection. So this is an integrated system. And the way I just explain it to people is it's really actually pretty simple. Resources are limited. And the immune system has these resources, but it has to figure out how to deploy them. And the military analogy is not actually a bad one. You know, different, you know, countries have different threats to their, their health, right? Uh, and there's a big difference between, say, a seaborne invasion and a land invasion. There's a big difference between a terrorist sleeper cell and, you know, a large army of tanks rolling up across a border. And so the immune system has to gather information from the environment and figure out what to do with its resources. And this is exquisitely well orchestrated and, and it comes down to the, the, the smallest scales of energy and matter. I mean, we're talking protons, electrons, photons, and for all I know, you know, subatomic particles, right? And, you know, when you look at what are the signals that we're getting from our environment, most people, when they talk about the immune system, will talk about food. They'll talk about how you've got to have a clean, healthy diet. It's got to be, and then, you know, there's so many different takes on this, right? You know, we're seeing more and more people going carnivore, more and more people going keto. You know, Rob Wolf and the the paleo train is still going strong, despite all the the censorship of them. And then there's all these other things. You know, the vegans are still out there. You know, like chomping at the bit, foaming at the mouth, trying to get everyone to stop eating eating animals and 
you know, people see big improvements in their health with all these different diets for a variety of reasons. But underneath all of this, at the end of the day, the immune system is trying to gather information from the environment and collect resources that, and then use those in order to maximize your robustness and your resilience against disease. Now, a lot of people hearing me say that would say, okay, yeah, but Dr. Stillman, what about the fact that people used to die of infections? You know, our, our, our Paleolithic ancestors, let's say, died of infections at really high rates and we can cure these infections and keep people alive. There is nothing more satisfying in my life than treating what I call Paleolithic problems with modern medicine. So give me a patient with an overwhelming bacterial infection any day of the week who's got a reasonably healthy physiology and body, and I will save that person's life. And that is like, that's, that's why I became a doctor. It's so much fun. I can't tell you how exciting it is to actually save a life. But here's the thing. Give me somebody who's 75, overweight, premature dementia, chronically debilitated, can barely get up out of a wheelchair, they have a laundry list of diseases, and they're on you know, a kitchen sink's worth of medications, and that person doesn't get better even when I give them antibiotics and fluids, or if they do, it's a little bit of a hollow victory because I'm thinking to myself, I'm sending this person back to their nursing home to basically you know, have what kind of quality of life. And yeah, this is where people need to understand that really the immune systems, the immune system, yes, I can save your life if you're dying of an overwhelming infection and your health is still really terrible. But the number one thing for staying healthy and robust, staying out of the ER, not getting hospitalized in the ICU is to live a life that's close to nature so that all your organ systems are healthy so that you have the necessary nutrients and so that your immune system has the information to make the right decisions and that's really the next piece of this that i think most people miss is that your immune system needs information to know what arm of the immune system to deploy so let's say right that it's the summer. Well, there's different bugs out in the summer than there are in the winter. Like just, I'm in Northern Minnesota right now because that's where I happen to be for this. I, they're, I'm basically helping out up here for the, what we expect to be the pandemic. And there's snow on the ground, right? And the trees aren't budding and there's no green leafy vegetables growing and the only things that are green are the evergreens, right? Well, now is not the time when you get an overwhelming parasitic infection because parasites don't grow well in the cold. If I were to fly to, you know, Malaysia or Thailand, where it's tropical and it's 80 to 90 to 100 degrees every day, well, guess what? The pathogens are different. It's and a parasite. Look, yeah, exactly. And when you look <laughs> at the nutrients that occur in different zip codes, different latitudes, different elevations, when you look at the kind of sunlight in those elevations, when you look at how that information is interpreted by the immune system, it shapes the immune response. So, you know, what does that really mean? Let's say that it's the summer. You need the vitamin D from the sun in order to keep your immune system healthy and strong. You, uh, in the winter, people have always subsisted on cold water fish in northern latitudes because it's the only way they could get the vitamin D that they need to be healthy and the vitamin A that they can't get during the winter from the sun because there's no UV light in those environments. And that's just one example. And you can go through every nutrient, which has these cycles in nature of how abundant it is. And then there's other interactions, like for example, um, you know, in, in long days, you get enormous amount of, you're under really stress because there's no, you don't get to sleep, your melatonin levels are, are dropping, and you can gain weight and you can develop a certain amount of insulin resistance. But at the same time, that's protective because you're gonna need to burn that fat off right. during the winter when it's like super in the cold. Arctic. Right, where I'm from, you know, you've got exactly. almost 24 hours a day of sun and you're trying exactly. to store as much fat as you can because in the winter you're going to be living off that fat. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, when I started getting into all this, that was one of the, you know, with my, uh, you know, staph infection that I got from, from, a, from a pedicure, you know, I started diving into this stuff. And one of the things that just blew my mind was, how the immune system changes with the seasons and how our body and hormone production and all these different things 
change with light cycles. And then I started thinking to myself, well, I've created this artificial environment where I'm getting up at five in the morning, flipping the lights on and training people till six, seven o'clock, eight at night and been doing it for 20 years. And it's no wonder I'm struggling because I'm living in an environment that is nothing like the environment that my body um, is adapted to thrive in. And I think a lot of people, it just, it doesn't even occur to them that, um, you know, reason we're having all of these issues with, with, with allergies, autoimmune disease is that the body just doesn't know what the hell is going on because the environment that we have created artificially is so out of touch with reality from the environment that we're basically have evolved in for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years that it's just totally confused. Exactly. Exactly. And so I I looked at, you know, I, I, came out of residency and started working at a functional medicine clinic and was struck by two things. One, a lot of people got better. I mean, incredibly better. You know, like we're talking like, you know, miracles. And I mean, this was a clinic where people would fly across the country to be seen. But there were also people who it didn't really matter what I did. They just seemed to get worse. Right. And I began to look at the way that we were thinking about medicine. And it was kind of like, you know, a lot of conventional medicine is just hopelessly out of date and really just fundamentally ignorant of the science. And I think there's also a problem there with sort of being pragmatic and empiric. You know, they expect they expect somehow for massive double-blind crossover placebo-controlled double-blinded clinical trials to get done for things that no one's ever going to be able to patent and therefore no one's ever going to make any money off of, which is just stupid and naive. It plays right into the drug company's hands. But a lot of them just don't actually read the literature and make simple, pragmatic assumptions. Like, for example, right, if you suddenly illuminate the night and deprive people of natural darkness, you know, would you expect them to get sick? Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, Darwin in like the 1850s was talking about the conditions of existence. You change the conditions of existence, you make animals sick, right? He didn't need double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover clinical trials in order to figure that out and hypothesize this. And we've proven it in ecology over and over again. And there's plenty of literature out there to back it up. Just go to a zoo. Like all the animals on antidepressants and anxiety medication, that you know, they can't reproduce. I mean, because they're not in the environment that they're supposed to be in, you know? Exactly, yeah. And the funny thing is, is, is most of the people that are on the conventional side would argue the opposite. They would say, you know, that natural people that have more of a natural approach are the ones that aren't looking at the, the research and, and, and looking at the science. And, right. Uh, you right. know, if you look at some of the stuff that's come out on circadian rhythms and circadian biology, and, you know, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for that here recently. Right. Um, it, it's insane. Like, literally, sunlight literally drives every organ in your body, every system in your body. But we've been kind of brainwashed to believe that, you know, you know, cover up outside, sunscreen, sunglasses, hats. Right. right. But, you know, don't don't even think, you know, a second thought about running around with no clothes on at night watching TV. Right. Um, it's it's crazy to think about that, that something that we've evolved with for however long you want to believe is bad for us, but these lights that have only been around, you know, these fluorescent bulbs that have only been around since the sixties or seventies. And now these new LEDs are, you know, don't even, don't even worry about those. You know, it's, um, it's just wild that people have just totally missed this concept. Completely. And I cover that in, um, you know, I've written so many blog posts in the last seven or eight months since I dove into the literature on sunlight. And it's just astonishing to me how, I mean, there's just this this disjointedness between the the most cutting edge researchers and then the sort of rank and file dermatologists and ophthalmologists. And there's really a an almost um, uh, a very illogical kind of bent in a lot of conventional medicine to just look at the natural environment as always being a liability without looking at it as a complex system of which we're just a part. And um, and I. You know, one of the things that I realized at this functional medicine practice that I was at is that, you know, you could correct people's levels and still have them. And it didn't matter what level it was, like 
their levels of dopamine or taurine or their you know this neurotransmitter or this hormone and you could even push them to super physiologic like super high levels and they would still tell you hey i don't feel right i don't feel better i still feel bad what happened and i began to realize that medicine was much more complicated than just measuring levels and replacing things like you might on a car like oh the you know the oil pans low or the gas tanks out or you know, we've run out of washer fluid or whatever um, and you really need to start looking at it as a much more complex system and start asking questions well is the timing of of different systems on you know are they integrated correctly is information being transferred to this system and does it have the proper machinery basically to uh, to handle the road of life? And that's where I got so fascinated by light because to me it was the other side of you know Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared. Everybody wants to talk about food and people really need to start talking about light because, and I'm not trying to minimize the effects of food. You know, I, I think that, is, that what I've seen people do with supplements hormones, drugs, I mean, all of that has a place. And, you know, to me, it's just, these are just tools in my toolbox, but you've got to have a toolbox that takes into account all of the potential tools. And your story is one of the most important to me of demonstrating, hey, here's a guy who's on the cutting edge of paleolithic nutrition, who, you know, knows Rob Wolf, who's got all this information and is very savvy with how to eat and how to exercise and how to do all this stuff. But until you get natural light back into your life, you're missing key signals that modulate your immune system. And what I noticed is that the sickest patients in this functional medicine clinic were young, tech-addicted people from highly populated zip codes. And they were constantly, you know, on their wireless laptops, you know, plugged in like with their wireless headphones on. And they all thought that this just didn't matter. And I would talk to them and they would eat incredibly, the, the perfect diet, you know, it was like green juices and bone broth and seaweed, all this stuff, right? And yet they weren't getting better. And then you would talk to people who, and I call it, I actually like to call this the redneck paradox. I would see these, <laughs> these guys who were out there like, you know, like the guy who's, 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 you know, laying cable for the, for the, the telephone company, the lineman, or, um, you know, a, a hunting guide or a fishing guide, right? It's like they eat, you know, absolute garbage. And I mean, their idea of lunch is like smoke this. too. Yeah. And they smoke and yet they're more robust in terms of their resistance to disease and their resilience in the face of say infection than some people who are over here doing yoga three times a day and, uh, eat, drinking green juice drinks and eating bone broth and whatever. And so that really struck me. The power of the sun is not to be, um, to be dismissed. And I, there were many cases that I saw where, you know, the wife who, who stayed at home and was indoors all the time got really sick, but her husband happened to be, you know, a fishing guide or, a, or just, you know, loved his outdoor time or whatever, and he didn't get sick. And um, the more I, and then I got into the whole, the whole light thing uh, and started to get more stories like yours and, and talk to other people and see, wow, there's so much more we can do for the immune system than just what we eat. And, you know, as, with that as sort of premise, I mean, right now, my focus with people is getting them out into sunlight, minimizing their artificial light at night, minimizing their exposure to microwave and radio wave radiations because those disrupt the immune system. Uh, and I think that's a big, big deal with, with COVID-19. And then getting them to eat a local seasonal diet uh, with an emphasis on organ meats and things like fish that have naturally occurring vitamin A and vitamin D that help run our immune systems and keep inflammation or inflammatory levels low. You know, if you haven't checked out Dr. Stillman's blog, and I'll put a link below, this is going to be released on YouTube and then also on my, my podcast, and I'll put a link to Dr. Stillman's blog. He's got some unbelievable articles um, about light sunlight, uh, real simple stuff that's written very, very well. Dr. Thank Simon, you. let's go into this, um, this belief that about sunlight and skin cancer, uh, that if you go outside and you literally, you know, get more than 15 minutes worth of sun, you're going to literally like, you know, you're going to have, you're going to instantly get skin cancer. you you know, your, your skin is going to age faster. Um, you know, that you need to cover up, you need to wear, you know, sunglasses and sunscreen and all this sort of thing. 
Let's go through the numbers. Let's go through some of the literature so that people can kind of do their own research and kind of they can look at this from their own perspective and come up with their own uh, their own belief system. Sure. So I like to tell people that if the sun causes skin cancer, then spoons make people fat. And I don't think anyone in their right mind would consider um, limitations on the use of and the prevalence of spoons to be an effective strategy for weight loss, right? This also does not mean that you should go out and have like three helpings of beer cheese soup with your spoon, right? When you look at the numbers for skin cancer, first of all, there's three major types of skin cancer. There's squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and melanoma. These cause nine to 10,000 deaths in the United States per year. Approximately 2.8 million people die in the United States per year. So you know, do the math, that's a fraction of a percent of people dying every year from skin cancer. Every other major cause of death, the top 10, is strongly linked to sunlight deficiency or a lack of sun. And even when you look at the data on whether or not sun exposure causes an increase in the risk of these cancers, what we have the best data on is melanoma. Because it's the most deadly skin cancer by far, of the 10,000 people or so that die of skin cancer, I think it's 7,000 of them die of melanoma. And many more people develop melanoma who end up getting you know, cut off before it metastasizes and becomes lethal. And the risk factors for melanoma don't actually include consistent sun exposure. So if you take, for example, manual laborers or even skilled laborers who work outside, people who are putting up you know, line for the telephone company or who are doing construction work or um, who are doing you know, natural resource jobs like forestry or surveying, they don't actually have an increased rate of melanoma. Yeah, because they have studies. a solar callus. They're, they're used to right. the sun exposure. It's, it's sitting on your ass inside in front of a screen and then going on spring break and burning you know, for you know, the whole weekend. Exactly. And this, so this gets to the, the heart of really what, you know, what is skin cancer, what causes skin cancer. If you look at the literature before the modern era, when particularly we had more dangerous exposures to fire, there were, there were a lot more people who would get a really severe burn, and then years later they would develop a skin cancer of that area. Note that I said, I didn't say sunburn, I said just burn. So right. thermal injuries can actually increase your risk of, of skin cancer. And what's the reason? Well, the burn causes a lot of damage and eventually that damage can result in a exhaustion of your stem cell supply and when you run out of stem cells you increase the likelihood of developing uh, cancers now the immune system plays a really important role that we're going to talk about in a minute but the damage part is really key now what is skin damage right when pe most people think about skin damage they think about the sun because they're used to getting burned in our modern era by the sun you know particularly you know, we've made it very hard to get burned you know, we have fancy oven mitts and we have ovens where you just turn dials and the dials go down. You know, we've got fire departments and fire extinguishers. I mean, people just don't get burned the way they used to. And uh, as a result, most of the burns that people experience today are from the sun. And the other piece of that, right, is we've moved inside. So if you think about it, it even if you spent 5% of your, of your time outside, you're getting a tiny fraction, 1 20th of the sun that your ancestors got. And the way that sunlight affects the skin is actually very, very uh, complex and needs to be understood in order to understand what's really going on with how light can contribute to skin cancer. So, you know, in the, over the course of the day, the proportions of light in the environment vary quite dramatically. Most people know that the middle of the day is when ultraviolet light is present in its strongest quantities. And as the season waxes and you get towards the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, you get more and more and more UV light. It's stronger and stronger and stronger, and you can burn faster in the middle of the day. What people don't realize is that early in the morning and later in the day, there's more red light and infrared light as a proportion of sunlight. And that's really important because one of the things we know about red and infrared light is that it preconditions the skin for an insult like a burn, and it helps it to not get damaged, and it helps it to heal faster afterwards. And this is why when you look at the literature on light therapy, you see that there's a lot of applications for treating people who had burns with red and infrared light. Well, you know, 42% of sunlight is infrared light, and a very high proportion of it is red light, particularly early in the morning and later in the day. 
So the best recipe for getting a sunburn, as most people know, is to wander out in the middle of the day with no sunscreen on, you know, white as a sheet, you never get any sun, or even worse, like fly south to some place that's got incredibly high UV levels that you're not accustomed to and go outside for even like five, 10, 20 minutes, people can get burned. And something really important for people to understand is that you don't have to burn in order for their, for skin damage to actually occur. Recent literature has shown that rates of lipid peroxidation, free radical generation in the skin from exposure to blue and green light is comparable in magnitude to that of sunlight in the middle of the day. So what does that mean? It means that even though you don't get a sunburn from your indoor fluorescent lighting, it's causing lipid peroxidation in your skin. And so people have this idea that, oh, it's the people who get the most sun who end up with the worst skin and the most skin cancer. Well, hang on a minute. Like my dad's lived inside his whole life. He has to get skin cancers burned off all the time. How does that make any sense, right? And he's not by, by no means the only one. I mean, most people today have gotten radically less sun than their ancestors did. And yet they, a lot of them are struggling with skin cancers, whether it's melanoma or squamous or, or, um, or basal cell carcinoma. Didn't, and the, the, uh, didn't the Navy do a study where they discovered that one of the highest rates of skin cancer was people that worked in nuclear submarines? I don't, I haven't seen that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, when you start to look at the actual epidemiological data for, for skin cancer, you begin Indoor to think, workers have a much higher rate than outdoor exactly. workers. Yeah. And there's a very strong, um, association in some of the literature with exposure to radio and microwave radiation, which would make sense with nuclear submarine workers. And let's like dig into why that is. So, you know, when you look at how the immune system works, it's totally plugged into your light environment. And a lot of this is mediated by the hormone of sleep, melatonin, which might better be called a neurotransmitter, but that's an academic <laughs> topic. So what, what determines melatonin levels? This is actually one of the reasons why red and infrared light can help us heal. Red and infrared light stimulate cells in our skin to produce melatonin. And when we look at the structure of the brain, some of the most recent research has focused on the fact that it's actually set up to basically guide near infrared light through the skull into the brain. And that's why the photobiomodulation devices that are focusing on the brain, most of them are using infrared light, not red light. And you, know, you have to think, wow, if this is true, if this is real, nature's got to have a reason for it, right? That's too complex to be happenstance or coincidence. So near infrared light and red light help your body to make melatonin in the skin. This actually boosts your melatonin levels at night and helps you sleep. What does melatonin do? It runs around the body, helping your mitochondria to stay healthy. What do we know about cancer? We know that cancer is a metabolic disease. The idea that just gene damage from say ultraviolet light or any reactive oxygen species is really only half of the picture because the nuclear genome is responding dynamically to changes in the environment and particularly energy generation capacity in the mitochondria. And that's why when you change the health of a cell's mitochondria, you can create a cancer or you can get rid of it. And this work has been very well, you know, the tires have been kicked on this, you know, ad infinitum by guys like Thomas Seafried at I think it's Boston University, but I could be wrong about that. And so what's really important to know about melatonin? Well, you know, guess what? Melatonin levels, lower your melatonin levels, the higher your risk of melanoma. The lower your melatonin levels, the higher your risk of lots of other cancers, particularly of the epidermal uh, of cells, your, your gut, a lot of your accessory gut organs, like for example, the pancreas. Um, I, I mentioned the skin, your higher risk of things like brain cancer, uh, lung cancer. I mean, it's just the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, part of this has to do with, as well, vitamin D. So the more sunlight you get, the higher your vitamin D level. And that vitamin D is really a function of your solar exposure and then your consumption of fish. And guess what? Your solar exposure drives your production of neurotransmitters, of other hormones, and of, um, at night, you know, your, your melatonin reserves that help your body to heal and regenerate. And yes, melatonin has very powerful effects on the immune system. 
And there's abnormalities in melatonin levels associated with allergies, autoimmune diseases, which then set people up for cancers and other degenerative diseases. So when you really look at the totality of the literature, and the problem with, with modern medicine subspecialization bent is that these people, like the dermatologists, just look at the skin and they're like, oh, like, you know, light can cause cancer. So cover up the skin. And you're like, hang on a minute. Like I'm a general internist. I care about all these other diseases that the dermatologists don't ever see. Right. And I'm seeing that my patients who don't get any sun are the sickest patients that I've got. So, and, and the same thing happens with, you know, the, the gastroenterologists, they don't read anything about the skin and the dermatology literature. So they have no idea about the effects of sunlight on, on health and disease. And, and it really takes a very broad view and a general practitioner to put all this together and say, hang on, what actually matters to my patients? What's actually important? And what do we actually need to do that the subspecialist thinks is important? Because I can tell you how many people come to me after they've already seen all the subspecialists and they're like, nobody else can help me. What do you got? And you can get amazing results just by telling people to get back into nature. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. It's something as simple as that. Let's, let's give people just a, a simple rundown of, you know, like your basic checklist for improving your overall health and immune system. Um, and it, and it, honestly, it's pretty simple. Like with my own story, like when I started getting out and, and just to, the commentary, you, you look at our modern life and you look at the, the research on night shift workers and, and the sicknesses that they have and that it is a carcinogen. Um, you know, our modern life is a perfect setup for disaster because one, we don't get vitamin D production, which is super important for everything that you just mentioned. And then we don't go outside, so we don't get melatonin either. And then if we do get melatonin, we don't uh, activate it because we're staring at our screen at freaking two o'clock in the morning on Snapchat yep. or whatever you're doing. Yep. So two of the most important uh, hormones, neurotransmitters, whatever you want to call them for our overall health and wellness, we have basically with our modern life have suppressed or eliminated. Um, so what can people do to... Um, get themselves going in the right direction where they start supporting uh, these systems as opposed to annihilating them. Right. So I'm about to, I'm putting together right now uh, something called the real light challenge where I give people just five really simple steps that are what I focus on as being the highest yield changes in their light environment. And I'm going to be hopefully putting that out maybe today, maybe a couple weeks. I'm not sure yet, but it's really pretty simple. You know, somebody who's a leader in the natural health community named Jonathan Wright, he said, copy nature. And, you know, I can't come up with a two word slogan for better health than copy nature. I mean, your body knows what to do when you give it the information from nature that it needs and the resources from your natural environment that it needs. Right. So, you know, I tell my patients, look, like fake light and fake food are going to make you sick. And a lot of what ends up, people end up you know, gravitating towards fake light and fake news, ironically, through you know, like really just bad information, which I call fake news. So what do I focus on right up front with people? First of all, early morning and late evening or afternoon exposures to sunlight are critical because they're helping condition the skin for that ultraviolet light stress in the middle of the day. So that's kind of where you got to start, especially if it's like summer. Otherwise, you, you know, people start going out and they like spend 20 minutes in the sun and they burn and then they're upset and they really didn't get the benefit that you wanted them to get. Uh, because when you burn, you know, you're, you're sort of worsening your ability to, to, to absorb solar energy. Um, once you're getting that early morning and afternoon exposure, that's when you can begin integrating the stronger doses of ultraviolet light for people, which are critical to good health and well-being. The next thing is looking at your indoor environment and saying, okay, how do I maximize my natural light exposure? Uh, for some people, this means rigging up an outdoor office. Uh, for some people, it means just you know doing the things that they would normally do inside, outside, or at the very least, near a window. Um, an opening on that up. note, yeah. One of the things that I notice with my patients is that one of their consistent complaints is, hey, my allergies are preventing me from getting outside. And that's why one of the things I focus on in my practice is, uh, is sublingual immunotherapy that you can give people and they, they can take at home to get rid of their allergies so they can get back outside into nature. The next thing is looking at the lighting inside. 
you know, anyone can change their light bulbs. And ironically, I think this shift from, you know, incandescent bulbs, which are very similar in their emission spectrum in many respects to the sun, um, to cold uh, fluorescent bulbs uh, and LEDs has been, you know, a major problem for the following reason. Those red and infrared wavelengths of light are essential for producing melatonin in your skin. It's also really critical for the health of your eye. And ocular diseases today are exploding in prevalence. And guess what one of the major risk factors is for getting melanoma of the eye? And specifically an area of the eye where you don't get any ultraviolet light. It happens to be working as a commercial chef. So you're getting fake light at night as a chef. You're eating food at night, which disrupts your circadian rhythms and tanks your melatonin levels and raises your insulin levels. And then you're never getting sunlight because you get off at two o'clock in the morning, you go home and you sleep for eight hours and you just miss you know, the first five to six hours of sunlight in the day, right? So when you start to look at the whole puzzle, all the pieces fit together and it's like amazing that doctors and any even just regular lay people don't get this because it didn't really take me that long to read all this just took me a long time to sort of ask the right questions and figure out the right questions to ask. But I tell my patients, look, incandescent bulbs are better than, infrare than fluorescence and LEDs because they have some warmth and some infrared light that they're going to emit. Now, the caveat to that is a lot of them still emit a lot of, uh, of blue and green light. Personally, I use a red headlamp if I get up in the middle of the night because it's the least suppressive of melatonin and it's a $20 solution to this problem that I have to buy some AAA batteries for every once in a while. But I have perfect vision and I have really good coordination. So I'm not worried about, you know, tripping over my feet if I go to the bathroom. You know, my 76 year old mother, I said, mom, you gotta buy zero blue light light bulbs and you gotta install them in your bedroom and your bathroom. Why? Because I really don't want to like have my mother stumbling around in the dark with a headlamp that doesn't give her the illumination that she might need. And then she ends up fracturing her hip. Exactly, right, I don't want that on me. And if you get zero blue light bulbs, and I tell people who are worried about the cost, look, buy them for the bathroom and the bedroom. You shouldn't need more than two or three to give you the illumination that you really need. You know, a lot of women want to have like very highly illuminated um, uh, lights over the, um, over the sink for the mirror. I get that. You want to look good and you want to know what you look like. Well, the answer is have a different you know, light fixture for that, and then have a different light fixture overhead or a night light that you can navigate to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And don't do your makeup at midnight or at, you know, four <laughs> o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why you would do that anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then for the rest of the house, you know, if you want to use zero blue lights, great. I think you're missing out on the infrared light, which I think is important. Um, and then it's just, you know, dim the lights at night. You know, you don't need more than two or three on. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed by talking to people who say, yeah, you know, I feel so much better when I, I keep the lights out. I've never really liked having the lights on. And then the next thing is your devices. Uh, I use a, a, a software on my computer called Iris that I can change the amount of light that's coming out of the screen and I can make it very red. That makes it hard to read certain websites, documents, whatever, um, particularly things that have like a red or orange um, color scheme but you'll figure it out you know and the beauty of it is you can change it on the fly and then you know, the other thing is why are you on the screen all night read a book call a friend you know play a board game do something normal frankly because i think a, a lot of people's medical issues today are they're tuned into you know all the horrible things that are happening across the world and you know the saying if it bleeds it leads right we're not actually wired for an environment. This is where I take fake news to task is like people are constantly under stress because of all this negative information that's flowing in. And they've got a circuit in their brain that is focused on threats to their health and well-being. But we're not optimized for a world where you can be worried about threats in Wuhan, China, you know, when really, you know, most of the time, Wuhan, China doesn't matter to you. Right. And you know, this is where I tell people, you've got to become a part of your local community. You need to talk to your neighbor. You know, go out and walk your dog in the morning and make it a thing where you and your neighbor walk your dog together, right? Because that normal human interaction is important. And we've lost a lot of the social capital in America that really bound our communities together and created strong ties. And 
really contributed to people's health and wellness. We've got an epidemic of mental you know, ill health in a society of people who are have never been more connected technically and more disconnected uh, in reality. And that's where limiting device exposure is important. If you're going to use them, definitely invest in or just download. There's plenty of free apps for modulating the screen. Uh, and then blue blockers. Uh, I wear raw optics uh, and blue blocks when I'm using uh, any kind of screen. Uh, those are sometimes you don't need them if you've got the screen modulated enough, or if there's or like if you're doing your work outside, like I do. Right, exactly. So there's a lot of ambient light. You really can't use them, otherwise you wouldn't be able to use the screen or see the screen. Right. Um, and those are the big tips that I I give people. And then when they're ready for it, if they're for, receptive to it, I just say, look, put your phone on airplane mode at night, so it won't wake you up with fake light and noise. Uh, and then uh, unplug your Wi-Fi router. And I'm amazed by the number of testimonials I get from people saying, I feel so much better just unplugging my Wi-Fi router and putting my phone on airplane mode. And the reality is we have studies that show that you know, we, we can change sleep architecture with microwave and radio wave radiation. These are quantum processes that can be disrupted by these you know, frequencies of light. And to the skeptics out there, I always point out, look, life can produce light from the near-infrared range to the ultraviolet range, even up to ultraviolet type C light, which is produced or blocked by the atmosphere. So if life's a giant battery that can produce light on demand and has to in order to survive, think about you know, your shivering response to cold exposure. Um, think about you know, the fact that you can recruit brown fat if you get cold enough that really can radically alter your ability to withstand the cold. I mean, life can make a lot of light and it really depends on light for enormous number of its, of its functions. Why would life never, ever, under any circumstance, from viruses to polar bears and everything in between, never use microwave or radio wave radiation? Why would it do that? It has to be bad for life, you know? Life's left that tool in the toolbox and never used it because microwave and radio wave radiations are bad for life on planet Earth. And we are allowing them to proliferate ad nauseum because it makes Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin and all these other tech giants lots and lots and lots of money. And it makes people in the Washington Beltway a lot of money. And then we have a surveillance state that's basically predicated upon sorting through all this data. And we have all these government bureaucrats pulling down a paycheck for spying on us for no good reason. And that is ultimately where it all comes together. You know, it's all part of the same system that's pulling us out of nature and feeding us fake food and illuminating us with fake light and feeding us fake news. And no wonder people are sick. And if they just keep it simple and they just copy nature and they get back out into sunlight and they, you know, use old fashioned light bulbs and they make their environment dark at night and they wear blue blockers to mitigate the damage and they eat real food that their great grandmothers would have recognized, they feel so much better. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's super, super simple. Exactly. You know, going back to the, the stress thing and, and, you know, we're designed to run from a bear maybe once or twice a month. Right. Uh, you know, but the problem is, is your body doesn't know the difference between running from a bear in your head and running from a bear for real, if you look at like Robert Sapolsky's work. Um, yeah. and, and literally when you've got your, your phone and, and, and it's constantly telling you about an earthquake in Russia or a, you know, a, you know, a mass shooting in wherever or a terrorist attack or you know, your body is just in this constant state of alert. And that's just not the way we're designed. Exactly. Yeah. And, totally. and so why don't you, Dr. Stillman, why don't you, um, I'll know. I'll give a little bit of my own testimonial here. So for the last week, I have literally lived 100% outside. And due to my job, I've never really been able to do that since I was a young kid. And the difference in the way I feel and the way I sleep is absolutely, it's night and day. Yep. So, and a lot of times, you know, it's like a bathtub, you know, it gets yep. to the top, one little drop spills over. So yep. the more you can do to get in more natural light, you might not have, be able to have a perfect, you know, all the time, but you might not need that. The more you can empty that bathtub so you can have some forgiveness. Um, the problem is most people's bathtubs are so full that one little drop spills it over. But, 
Dr. Stillman, why don't you tell people where uh, people can find you, where they can find your blog, how they can get in contact with you. Um, we'll end with that. Sure. So my personal website is stillmanmd.com. Uh, I blog at medium.com and I have a online fitness course called uh, Polar Bear Fitness at polarbear.fitness. And really the Polar Bear Fitness course is a basically a crash course in circadian biology, circannual rhythms. And I share really my top health, wellness, fitness tips there. And people can ask me questions and I post video responses. So it's, a, it's, it's actually my favorite resource to share with people and people can get a huge value in terms of my, uh, my expertise and what I tell people to do um, when they come to see me as a patient just by enrolling in the course. Uh, and then uh, I'm on social media. My handle is StillmanMD on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, Instagram. And I, you know, I, I view my calling as, um, I, be I strongly believe in what Hippocrates he said. He said that the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. And that's exactly what I try to do with my social media. It's my best advice. It's the top things I pay attention to with patients. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I, I see patients because it needs to be interpreted in a context and people need to know what they uh, in particular need to know or it needs to be tailored to them. Um, but that's how people can get in contact with me. And if they want to contact me directly, they can do so via my website. Awesome, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Great Good to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.